Ladies and gentlemen, the next gen band. It might seem crazy what I'm about to say. Sunshine, she's here, you can take a break. I'm a hot air balloon, I can go to space. With the air, like I don't care, baby, by the way. Talking this and that. Give me all you got and don't hold me back. I should probably warn you, I'll be just fine. A no offense to you, don't waste your time. Here's why.
Let's thank the Next Gen Band for that great performance. Band members include foster, adopted, and biological children, raising their voices to bring about change. They were also joined by the Florida Leadership Academy and Florida Youth Shine. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome the Florida Department of Children and Families Secretary, Mike Carroll. Thanks. Um, thank, hello. Thank you, everybody. And that was amazing, wasn't it? I, I didn't know that I was going to be dancing before. I thought I'd be embarrassed enough here, but to dance in front of 2,500 people. Anybody that doesn't think that we have some extraordinary, some talented young folks that we serve every day, come watch them play again. They haven't been together that long, and they had so many people up and dancing. What a great job. Uh, and they're lucky they ended when they did, because I was about to break out a couple of John Travolta dance fever moves, <laughs> right? Uh, I just feel uh, really humbled and honored to stand before you today as the interim secretary. Uh, I've come to uh, more of these summits uh, than I can count and sat in the audience just like all of you. So uh, to say it's a surreal feeling to be up on the stage addressing you uh, is an understatement. I'm surprised by it as I'm sure some of you are. Um, but we'll do the best with it, right? This year, it's, uh, we have a record-breaking attendance, and you can see it by the number of chairs in the room. Now, they aren't all full yet. I just walked through the lobby, and there must have been 200 people trying to check in. Uh, I guess that's a good thing, because we have so many folks here today that want to participate in that. And I think it's a sign, a, a, a real sign, that we have growing uh, and very strong partnerships at all levels in child welfare, and particularly at the community level. Because it's, that, it's that, at that level, I think, where we see some of the real innovative uh, solutions to our child welfare issues. And so for that part, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see so many folks here. I also think it's uh, an indication uh, that this really is a pivotal moment, I think, a uh, pivotal time in the history of child welfare. Uh, even with the great numbers, I think the diversity in the crowd uh, is even greater. We have uh, everybody from the whole spectrum of our system of care here, from the community right up to our core partners represented. And before I get too far into my remarks, I just want to recognize a few folks. The light is in my eyes, so I can't see where anybody's sitting, but I just want to recognize a few folks. Representative Gail Harrell, who is uh, chair of the House Healthy uh, Family Subcommittee, and was instrumental, I think, in passing the child welfare legislation that went into effect on July 1st. Not only that, instrumental in passing 
what I think was great legislation uh, for protecting kids from uh, human trafficking. She's not only here today, but she's here all week with us. Uh, we have Alan Abramowitz, Executive Director for the Guardian Ad Litem's Office, somewhere here. We, we affectionately refer to Alan as David's brother, right? We have Kurt Kelly here from the Florida Coalition of Children, and he has uh, been really a, a, a good partner for me in my early tenure and somebody that uh, I really need to partner with moving forward because uh, we have to move this system forward together, and I appreciate his partnership. Uh, but we have all our other community partners here, too. All of our lead agencies are represented. We have a huge, I think a huge, uh, I've never talked to so many judges in the same place as I did yesterday. You know, uh, yeah, I, I would make a joke, uh, you know, wh where I come from, the projects in Boston, when you talk to that many judges at the same time, you did something really, really wrong. <laughs> but I'm glad to have them here because they really are, uh, they stand with us every day and, and they're called on really to make the tough decisions uh, on what's in the best interest of the kids. And that's not always uh, easy. Uh, we have all of our community-based care lead agencies here. We have all of our case management organizations here. We have six sheriff's offices here, four from my former area uh, that are in, ch that, that do child protection in their communities. We have folks from child protection team uh, here. We have children from, uh, children, we have uh, folks from Children's Legal Services, and that's from the department, but it's also from the Office of Attorney General and the State Attorney. And we have many other community partners on the ground. I don't mean to leave anybody out. Uh, and most importantly, we have foster parents here too. So it's a pretty diverse group. I also want to thank, and, and this is most important to me, I think, I also want to thank all of the frontline folks who are here from all organizations, including DCF. You guys are the folks that have feet on the ground every day. You are the folks that interact with our families every day. You are the ones who help protect kids. You are the ones who help heal families. And for that, I thank you, and, and, and thank you for participating this week. Uh, I said uh, at the beginning I thought this was a uh, pivotal moment uh, in the history of child welfare, um, and I think it is. We've been through a rough patch this past year, and we've come under intense media scrutiny, uh, largely around child fatalities. And so it's not been easy uh, in a lot of communities, um, and hopefully the, the, the media scrutiny will help us get uh, better. But I'm one of those folks who don't believe uh, that we should be ducking uh, the media scrutiny. I think we should be embracing it. I don't think we should be ducking the criticism. I think we should be embracing it. We share a mission in this room, and it's to protect kids. It's to help heal families. And I know, and you know, we don't always get it right. And when we don't get it right, the system ought to be held accountable. We don't always achieve the best outcome for all the families we serve. We know that. And when we don't, we ought to be challenged, and we ought to challenge ourselves to look at what we're doing, to learn from it, and to see how we can do it better. We owe that to the folks we're serving. We owe that to the babies, to the children, and to the families we're serving. I think we have a lot of committed folks in this room you know, I, I, I like to say that as we approach this work, not only do we have to embrace it, the reason we need to embrace it is because I think we need to pursue this job and, 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 and protecting kids with the same fervor, the same passion, the same commitment, the same dogged persistence that we would in protecting our own baby, our own children. If we could get folks to act uh, at that level, I think this would be a better system. But I do think what you do every day helps heal families. And for the frontline staff, despite what you may hear sometimes, I personally believe uh, that you're heroes in this. Unsung, albeit, unsung heroes for sure, but nonetheless heroes. I know when we see the media attention that we get, lots of times it focuses on high-profile cases, and, and, and most often it focuses on 
cases that have tragic outcomes. But I also know that every day, in every community, we have CPIs and case managers that knock on doors at all hours of the day, all hours of the night, and you never really know what to expect or what you'll find on the other side of that door. You come across families every day that are struggling with what I think are pretty complex, sometimes long-standing issues. Substance abuse addiction, domestic violence, mental health issues, and, 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 and many more things. Sometimes you're asked to act quickly to protect children that live in some of those homes. A lot of times you're asked to interact with parents that you know don't have the wherewithal or the protective capacity to protect or parent their child. More often than not, and, and, and despite the perception of what child welfare is and isn't, more often than not, when you go into living rooms, you provide families with hope, you provide advice, you provide feedback, and sometimes, yes, we provide folks with a swift kick in the rear end that they can use to hopefully turn their life around and become a better, more stable parent for their child. Well, I don't think we always get it right, and I don't think we always agree on where we're going. I don't think it's because we don't care. That's the one place I draw the line. Call us on poor performance. Challenge us on systems issues. But don't say we don't care. You can't do this job every day and not care. You can't do it. The work is too complex. The stakes are too high, the workload is immense, and if you haven't found this out yet, if you haven't been around long enough, you don't do this work to get rich, <laughs> right? You really don't. You have to care to do this job. It has to be in your DNA. You have to. There was a study I saw that was done out of Scotland, and it was done in the aftermath of media scrutiny around child fatalities in Scotland. And what the study found was the impact of that media scrutiny and the environment that ensued on those folks working in the child welfare uh, profession, all folks, not just the folks on the ground level, disrupted sleep and lack of sleep, long and erratic hours, poor diet, skipped meals, negative impacts on personal relationships, haunting memories of particular cases, and physical threats and verbal abuse from parents. You don't do this job because you don't care. You can't. The study concluded that the biggest stress, the greatest stress on child welfare workers, was that you're asked to make decisions every day on, I, and I quote this, on limited information within the parameters of respectful uncertainty and healthy skepticism. Think about that. You're asked every day at all levels of our system to make decisions based on limited information while operating in the parameters of stressful uncertainty and healthy skepticism. You think you're doing the right thing, you hope you're doing the right thing, but you never really know and it gnaws at you. That's why you don't get any sleep. That's why you miss meals. That's why you got long hours. You give up your weekends, you give up your holidays. Your family life goes to heck in a handbasket, right? You don't do this job, folks, because you don't care. You have to care. And uh, stress in this job is inherent. Right? It's the nature of the business that we do. But I think what we have to guard against is adding additional stress where it doesn't belong. Media scrutiny is a good thing because it holds us accountable. The double-edged sword to media scrutiny is that it increases stress within the system. And sometimes if it's not handled right, it leads to elevated stress between partners on the ground. 
People stop working together because you have to affix blame someplace. And when that happens, it adds stress to the system. And, and, and my message to you is we have to make a conscious decision to be part of the solution. We have to choose every day to be part of the solution. And if we don't, even if it's not our intention, sometimes we end up being part of the problem. We have to work together as partners to create a work environment that facilitates high performance. Folks who do this work need to feel safe. Folks who do this work need to feel respected. Folks who do this work need to feel supported. And it's up to leadership in this room to make sure that happens, to provide that environment. We owe that to the folks that do the job every day, but if our expectation is that they do it well and we get good outcomes, it's also a must for us. I also believe that no one person or no one agency can do this work, public or private. Nobody can do this work and do it well alone. We call it a system of care, and a system of care means everybody. A system of care means all those partners I mentioned already, right? It's everybody from DCF to our case management organizations, our CBCs, our judges, our legal, our guardian ad litem, our foster parents, all of our feet on the ground, all of our service providers. That's a system of care. And the greatest thing about community-based care is we gave and we empowered local communities to engage in that effort. That's the greatest strength of community-based care. But it only works if everybody works together. It only works if everybody works together. And sometimes we create our own issues. We coined that term child welfare system. Anybody here ever hear that? Child welfare system. We're the child welfare system. That drives me crazy. As if the welfare of children was the sole responsibility of a state agency responsible for child protection or a community-based care lead agency in any county or circuit. The welfare of children is everybody's responsibility and it starts long before there's a call to the abuse hotline. And if we're really gonna be successful at preventing abuse and keeping kids safe, then we need to get upstream on this battle and involve communities in this fight with us, or it doesn't work. Now, I'm on a timer here, so there can't be much clapping or you'll put me behind. <laughs> Henry Ford said, coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress, working together is success. I think he's right. Partnership isn't easy. You have to work at it every day. You have to have a shared mission. You have to have a shared vision on where you're going. You have to have aligned values. And most of all, I think, you have to trust in your partner. If there's no trust in your partner, there is no partnership. What I'm here to tell you today is I am as committed as ever to ensuring that we partner with all of you because I think that that's the first step we need to take to begin getting to where we all want to be. And I'm going to work as hard as I can to ensure that our partnerships remain strong. Uh, it's a funny thing, uh, and, and maybe this is just me, maybe I don't know if this is true, the good news is I think, or I feel, it feels like to me, that our partnerships are getting stronger every day. And I think we have to be committed to working at it to make sure that progress continues. In recognition of that, uh, I'm going to be sharing the stage today with some of my partners, some of my colleagues. These are the folks that we can't be successful without. Sean Salamita, President of Families First Network, who will speak from the CBC perspective today. Shelly Katz, who's the Chief Operating Officer uh, at Children's Home Society. I joked with her the other day, Children's Home Society is a pretty, pretty big case management organization. 
right? And, 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 and we've got some pretty big case management organizations besides CHS, but as they go, I go. Because if they're unsuccessful, I'm unsuccessful. So I'm sure rooting for you, <laughs> right? We also have Kelly Paris. Kelly Paris is the executive director at the Hillsborough County Children's Board. And she is one of the many community partners that we have on the ground that uh, assist us in so many ways, in non-traditional ways, uh, that support our families and give us a much more holistic approach to the work we do. I began by saying uh, at the beginning of this that this is a pivotal time for child welfare, and I believe that. But it's not just because of where we've been, it's not just because of the year we've just been through, it's not just because of uh, um, the struggles we've been through, but I think it's a pivotal time for child welfare because of where we're going. Governor Scott pushed hard this last legislative session to get more feet on the ground doing child protective investigations. The legislature, with the leadership of folks like Representative Harrell, Senator Sobel, pushed hard to pass uh, I think, some of the most significant child welfare legislation in recent history. I think together the governor and legislator sent a pretty strong message that we in Florida can do better, we must do better for the children and families we serve. And I think they've also put their money down on the table and said we're willing to support that effort. I hope to continue that momentum this year by continuing to work with the governor, continuing to work with the legislature, this year with a focus on case management and on services to our families. <laughs> and on the continued integration of substance abuse mental health. Because some of these other programs, with, without them fully integrated, we can't fully serve our families. We can't get effective outcomes. I think we're already making tremendous strides on implementing the legislation, and we already had improvement strategies in place before that. We're in the process of hiring, uh, training, and deploying new CPIs. When we're done with that, caseloads will be at 10. That will be the average caseload size, 10. <laughs> you can't do this work on the CPI side of the house or the case management side of the house with high caseloads. You can't do it. The first step was to get our caseloads down, and so I am thankful to the governor and to the legislature for giving us help with that, because that reduction gives us hope. We're also in the process of deploying the safety methodology. And to me, that's important, because if you look a lot of times when we don't get a good outcome, or we don't do our best work, sometimes because we don't see the whole picture. Sometimes we're looking at snapshots in time. We're incident driven. We have to get to a place where we see the whole motion picture of the family because our interventions with the family are all about changing their trajectory, giving them hope, providing them with a path to a different future. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And so the safety methodology is geared to kind of bring us in that direction help us understand the whole motion picture of that family. We used big data this year. That, that, that's a coin, that's a phrase I see it a lot, right? Big data. Uh, particularly around child fatalities. And through it we were able to identify the highest of high risk kids that we serve in our system. And you've, you, you know the profile and I won't go over the profile with you. But what that information allowed us to do was focus on those cases and triage them differently than we worked them before. We have things now like the dual CPI approach, which we'll be deploying this year, but we also have rapid safety feedback that allows us to interject some of our best, some of our most seasoned, experienced folks into cases when critical decisions are being made around child safety to provide just-in-time feedback, just-in-time mentoring, just-in-time technical assistance. And I think when we get that fully deployed, I think we'll start to see better, more informed decisions around child safety. And, and, and I, I want to thank Eckert for their leadership in helping us uh, get that deployed. We also deployed a, a uh, child fatality pr prevention website. And 
Um, this was something that was in the legislation, but we wanted to take it even further than was required in the legislation. Part of our issue with the department was there was a perceived lack of transparency. So I want to put every child death in the last 10 years out there so the whole public can see it. Transparency should not be an issue that we deal with. We should be transparent. What, should, what we should be dealing with are the issues that led to poor outcomes for these kids. And so we put all of the data out there. And it's our hope that by putting all of the data and information out there, we can use that information to improve our case practice, but also communities can use that to better shape their prevention strategies. Because the fact of the matter is, in my old region over the past six years, 25% of the children who died, we knew. One third of the families we had involvement with at some point. And so there's no doubt we have to do better. But if that's all we focus on, I miss the three quarters of kids who experienced the same fate and they met the same profile, but we didn't know about. Two thirds of the families we didn't know about. But other folks in the community know those kids. Other folks in the community are serving those kids and families. And so how do we get the information to them in a way that makes a difference and saves lives beyond the ki kids and families that we're dealing with? We're also continuing to integrate uh, child abuse and substance abuse, or child abuse, integrate substance abuse and mental health into the child uh, welfare arena. We have FIT teams deployed in four regions, uh, and we hope to have more. This year, we uh, stood up, or Florida State stood up the uh, Florida Institute for Child Welfare, which is a, a godsend to me because believe it or not, in some circles, I am not looked at with the highest credibility. And so I want partners that can do research with me. I want partners that can come in objectively and look at complex issues that we can look at and resolve together. And I think that's what that will bring to the system. And, and, and uh, Dr. Uh, Patty Babcock is actually with us with a couple of staff here and, and will be here all week. If you haven't met her, and you run into her, say hello. I'm not here to tell you that we've arrived or that we're finished. We're not. I'm also not here to tell you that we're terrible, far from it. The rest of the nation looks at Florida and in many ways considers the Florida as a benchmark in child welfare, a benchmark. We have our struggles just like the rest of the country, even beyond the rest of the country. Look at the uh, study in Scotland. That could be us, right? That study was done in a foreign country and could describe us to a T. So we have some of the same challenges that other folks are dealing with. But I'm absolutely proud of the response that Florida has had this past year in response to some of the challenges we have. When I was appointed uh, interim secretary, I had more folks come up to me, or just as many folks come up to me, and said congratulations, and the other half extended their condolences to me. Now that's a scary thing, right? And at first, I, you know, it is kind of funny when you think about it, um, but I gotta tell you, I have a daughter, a beautiful daughter. She's just turned 26, and she's getting married in January. I have a son, who I want to talk about later, 17, senior in high school. And I can guarantee you that they would prefer that dad have a stable job and a stable income because they have bills that need to be paid, <laughs> right? But I don't really focus on how long my tenure might be. I like to focus on the extraordinary opportunity I was given. And I'm a realist about that, by the way. I understand the circumstances uh, that led to my appointment. It wasn't like there was a long list of folks waiting to take the job, <laughs> right? But it doesn't matter to me how the window of opportunity opened. I plan to jump through that window with both feet, and I plan to work as hard as I can, and in collaboration with everybody in this room, to make a difference, a positive difference, for the kids and families we serve. And this is my commitment to you going forward. 
the department, the coalition, our CBC partners, the case management organizations, the Florida Institute, we're all going to work in partnership, real partnership with all of you to improve child safety and to improve case practice and decision making in every county in this state. We're going to work together to make sure we can recruit, hire, and retain the best and the brightest. Folks who share our passion, who share our commitment for this work, and have the education and skill base to do it and do it well. We're going to work with you in partnership to make sure that you have the training, the resources, to do your job and to do it better. We're going to continue to work on integrating child abuse. Child, why do I keep saying that? We're going to continue to work to integrate substance abuse and mental health because I think that's critical. If we can't effectively treat folks who have chronic substance abuse issues, we can't protect kids who live in those homes. So we've got to do a better job at integrating the substance abuse mental health system with our child welfare system. I can tell you that I am absolutely, absolutely committed to continue to recruit an army of the best foster parents in the world. And, and I, don't, I, I don't say that lightly. I mean that. I think foster parents are the backbone of everything we do. Most traumatic moment in a child's life, other than possibly the abuse they suffered when living in their home, is to be put in another home where they don't know anybody. Our foster parents provide care to kids 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. They do more to love and heal our kids than any service we can provide. Why on earth wouldn't we? Why on earth would we not have them at the table as partners when we're talking about the welfare of children? And I, I, I want to tell you a quick story. And, and this, this is going to just an example of the extraordinary foster parents we have in the state. We had a little girl in my former area. And this just happened last week. Her name was Celiana. She's four years old now. She was born with a rare medical disease, and she's terminally ill, although she's beaten off the odds to live this long. She spent the first year of her life in the hospital. When she left the hospital, she went to a medical foster home with a family, the Wade family. And she's stayed there since. Mrs. Wade knew that Celiana is terminal. And she didn't want this child to pass without having a forever family. So she decided to adopt Celiana. She has another child that's 15 years old, also a disabled child living in her medical foster home that they previously adopted, right, 15 years old. When they were proceeding with the adoption, their 15-year-old child had a stroke that left half her body paralyzed, and the parents were at the hospital caring for the 15-year-old. The adoption took place over the telephone. It took place over the telephone because we have a judge that's willing to do that. We have a system that's willing to get that done. We have folks that are willing to put the interest of a child first and over the bureaucracy. Celiana was adopted last week. Cili now, Celiana's prognosis is not good. She's still terminal. In fact, she's, she's probably not long for this earth. I believe that she's going to go to a better place. I believe she's going to go to a place where she can leave her disability and the incredible struggle she's had her whole life, a struggle that none of us can ever imagine. And she's going to be able to leave that behind her. And I think that's great. But in my heart, I also believe 
that when she makes that journey, she knows in her heart that she's not making it alone because she has a forever family and she has a mom that loves her and she has a mom that will forever remember her in her heart, her mind, her memory. She won't be forgotten. I know she knows that and she knows that because we have extraordinary foster parents. And the Wades are just an example of the extraordinary foster parents we have. I talk all the time and I say that the welfare of children is not about a state agency, it's not about a lead agency, it's about everybody. I can tell you we have children in our system right now that need foster parents just like the Wades. And we need folks in every community to step up and do what the Wades and so many of our foster parents here have already done. To do extraordinary things for some of the extraordinary children that we serve every day. The last commitment I'll make to you, and this is another one that's near and dear to my heart. I believe that all our actions, all of our interventions, all of our decisions should center squarely around what's in the best interest of the child. Our job, really, is to protect kids. It's to save lives, right? And if you don't have the child at the center of all your decisions, how can that happen? I believe that every child has something inside of them that makes them them. Something inside of them that makes them unique. It's a light. You see it. If you're like me, you love to be around kids because you can see it in their eyes, you can see it in their smile, you can see it when they're playing and how happy they are. They have a light that burns in them. It gives, it, it, it's what makes them them. Our job in child welfare, and when I say save lives, I mean it's to protect that light. A lot of times we say, we save lives as if the only thing we do is prevent child fatalities. To me, preventing child fatalities, it's a given. It's an absolute must. It's an expectation. We should be working every day to ensure that families we work with have zero preventable child deaths. We should be working every day toward that goal. But that's not what I mean about saving children. When I say we save children, it's about protecting the light inside of them and helping that to burn brightly. Sometimes, if they are not at the center of all the decisions we make and all the actions we take, even if we don't do it intentionally, we dim that light. And if we do it enough, we extinguish that light. And then those kids can spend a lifetime looking to turn that light back on. That's not fair to the kids we serve. That's what best interest of the child's about. I adopted a child from the Child Welfare Agency. He came to me as a little baby. And when he came to me, I had, I, quite frankly, I, I didn't know he was gonna be my forever child. He didn't become available to be adopted until he was three. We didn't adopt him until he was almost four, okay? If you meet my son today, he is as opposite of me as can be. You know, I'm a big, I love football. I'm a football coach, I love sports. My son doesn't like sports. We took him out to play football and he's practicing beside my team, he's this tall. And the coach said, everybody take a knee. And the only one who wasn't on a knee was my son. And the coach said, hey, Jay, why aren't you on a knee? And he said, I'm not going to get dirty. <laughs> At that point, I knew he probably wasn't going to be a football player. <laughs> but he's a very special kid. And what I'm proud about my son is that he is so comfortable and so confident in the person he is. He doesn't care what other people think. I wish I was like him when I was 17. This kid will wear anything. He'll look like anything and he just feels very comfortable about it. God, I admire that in him. But when he was young, he didn't like to meet new people. 
And every time he met somebody new, he would get behind my leg and he would hold on to my leg and you'd have to walk like this because you couldn't get him off the back of the leg. Every time I brought him to daycare, I felt like a criminal. The daycare providers had to physically rip him from me and he was just screaming and crying and that's all you see driving to work is his face, right? And, and you're miserable, you gotta call the daycare. Is he okay, do I need to come and get him? Well, I can't help but see the child welfare world through the lens of my child. Because there, but for the grace of God, go him. And so when we bring a child into care and we move that child with people we don't know or we don't give a lot of thought to where we place that child, then we move them again. That has an impact on that child. And I don't know if that happened to Jay enough of times that he'd be the same person he is today with the same confidence uh, and, and, the, and the same level of self-esteem that he has. I remember we adopted him when he was four, when he was seven years old. He always knew he was adopted, by the way, because my wife and I used to tell him that Sam came from mommy's belly, you came from mommy's heart. So he always knew he was adopted. But he never knew the specifics. Quite frankly, he didn't care. And then one day, the CPI is knocked on my door. His mother had another child with another man. And they wanted to know if we could take the child. Well, I didn't want to take the child without talking to my son first. And I was kind of angry because when the time came to tell Jason about the details, I wanted it to be in our time frame. And it didn't work out that way. And I fretted over calling him in and talking to him about this. Because you know what I worried about selfishly? I worried what he would think about me. Oh my God, is he going to want to know who his real dad is? Is he going to want to know what his real mom is? Is he going to love me the same way he loves me now? Now that's kind of selfish, I know, but I got to tell you, I thought that way. And when we called him in and we sat, here's a seven-year-old kid, we sat him at the table and we started telling him the facts of this case. And I could see the fear in his eye and he started to cry and I felt terrible. And I said, Jay, do you not want your brother to come here, his half-brother? And he said, no. He said, I don't care about that. But does this mean that I can't live here anymore? Well, I got to tell you, then I was really hopping mad because he said, absolutely not. That's not what that means. Well, kids can be resilient because as soon as we said, Jay, you're going to be ours forever, he stopped crying, got up and said, okay, can I go? I don't care what to do. Can I go out with my friends? <laughs> okay. And me and my wife were left like basket cases. I tell you that because kids at that age, they don't understand permanency, but they do understand attachment. They don't understand the difference between a biological mother or father and who they consider to be their mom and dad. It's who they love and who they know. And, 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 and why should any kid that age? Jay was adopted. Okay, and still he was asking questions related to permanency. Can you imagine kids in our system who haven't been adopted and how they think about permanency? I think back now it took my son until he was three years old to become eligible for adoption and we didn't adopt him until he was four. I can't imagine my life today had somebody walked into my living room and said, mom just signed surrenders, voluntary surrenders, and we're gonna have this child adopted to a private adoption agency with somebody he never knew or met. I couldn't imagine it for me. More importantly, I couldn't imagine it for him. That's not what we do. That's not who we are. That's not what our systems of care try to achieve every day. We save lives. That means we keep the light that burns inside these kids on. And hopefully we make it burn brighter. We don't take action that diminishes it. I'm all for providing services to families because I think most families, given the right services and the right amount of time, 
can turn their life around and be effective parents for their kids. But they don't have forever to do it. They don't. Kids can't wait forever. They're in the most formative years of their life. They need someone that's going to love them. They need someone that they know is going to be around forever. And the quicker we get there, the better off we are. That's the best interest of children. And I know that I'm preaching to the choir here, but I will commit to you that I'm going to continue to push legislation, to push rule, to push policy, to push practice, to make sure that the best interest of the child is at the centerpiece of everything we do, because it's the right thing to do. Now, you guys don't see this, but there's a red light that's blinking. That, that means if this was the Oscars, the music would be on, the commercial would be starting, and somebody would be grabbing me right now. Um, so let me wrap up with this. I want you all to know I am absolutely proud of the mission that we share. Absolutely proud of the collective work we do every day. You really are heroes. And I stand before you today not as the interim secretary, because to me that's a title. Now it's a good title. It's one I wouldn't mind having for a while, but it's a title. What I really stand before you as is an advocate. Because my role is to be an advocate for the children we serve, for the folks who do this work every day, and for the systems of care that we all work so hard to improve. And so my commitment to you going forward is that I will work with all of you to make sure that we do the right thing for our kids, for the families we serve, for the people who do this work, and for the systems of care that we work so hard to put in place. Next up is my partner, Sean Salamita. Before he comes up, I want you to watch a short video. Uh, I said at the beginning of this that no one does this work alone, and I mean it. And we're going to show you a couple of videos. The first one is really going to show you the nature of the work you do. And I hope you, that you enjoy the work, because whether you're in the video or not, it represents you, and it represents the teamwork that takes place in every circuit. Uh, around this state. I thank you for coming to the summit, and I hope this summit proves to be a, a, a real jump start to, to even further strengthen our partnership and also laying the groundwork for improving our case practice. I think we've done great things in Florida, but I think we can do even greater things uh, by working together. And what's that tie say? It can be done. Just re remember that. It can be done. Thanks. I spoke with the reporter, and right off the bat, I attempted to make contact with the mother at her home. When I got there, there was music blaring. I could hear that clearly from the outside, uh, but nobody came to the door. So I had to go back through the file, and uh, I found a contact number for her mother, uh, and she gave me her address, and that was actually where I made contact with the family. Okay, initially when I saw the child, she was sleeping for a part of the time. Uh, there was nothing that stood out to me immediately at that time. The following morning was very different, though. The thing that was worrisome was his description of the way the baby was breathing, the wheezing, and the way he described it alarmed me because the baby was very young. She almost sounded like she was choking on her own mucus. She had this really heavy, labored, gasping, or wheezing. I wasn't real sure about the mother and her stability with her history. We reviewed all the documentation that we had and then we went ahead and immediately took it to the program administrator for a second tier consultation. I'm looking for a three-dimensional view of the family and in this particular case when we were going through our conversation and talking about this five-month-old child it became clear when we put the pieces together that one of the first things that needed to happen was this child needed to be seen medically to make sure the child was okay. I opted for the emergency room because you you can't just expect a pediatrician to drop what they're doing, and I wasn't really sure what I would find. There were um, cans of formula that were unopened that, you know, mom said I have three cans of formula. Well, the next morning, 
you still have three unopened cans of formula. You just want, you want to make sure that that child is okay. So he immediately followed up on that. Um, in fact, drove the mom and the child himself to the emergency room. And the baby was placed in um, the hospital for failure to thrive and uh, they had concerns for starvation. When we see the child, actually the child was quite small for the age, but the child was not uh, toxic or ill appearing. The child acted extremely hungry. And while I was talking to the mom, I was feeding the child formula, and the child was sucking vigorously on the formula. Anytime I, I uh, pull out the formula, the baby was screaming. When they fed the baby at the hospital, the baby was eating like it was starving. It was just sucking so ravish, you know, just sucking on his bottle like it was starving. And that concerned them because it's not that the baby wasn't eating or didn't have an appetite, the baby was very hungry. And as it turns out, as you know, the child um, has a condition, a medical condition where she cannot absorb nutrients. So basically she was slowly starving to death. The doctor said absolutely it was a failure to thrive and that it was possible that if this baby had been brought in, the baby would have died within the next couple days. A, a number of services were attempted to be brought in. The grandmother was very key in this because she moved right in the home. She actually left her own home and moved in with her daughter and her grandchild, which was great because it gave me eyes in the house. There's the children's medical services that was contacted in relation to this to make sure that mother has a training. We contacted the child protection team, which is always contacted in any kind of medical neglect or any of that kind of stuff. We have to have them on record to have any kind of findings. I used uh, ESP, it's a targeted case management program. ESP case management, so they actually take it on and then all the services that the family, the mother and the children need, they actually will get those services for them, get them in place and manage those services. With this particular one, it was almost a daily basis in the beginning because I definitely handled the targeted mental health case management, but when I went into the home and did the first visit, I noticed that there were some other things that she needed that the DCF worker was able to provide a little bit. Um, the child safety lock, simple things like that that he really helped with and we went back and forth with to make sure not only once he made sure she had it and knew how to use it, I made sure when I went in that she was using them. I actually met with the case manager uh, a few times during the course of the investigation, so I know she is working with the family right now. It was kind of a three-way coordination between myself, DCF, and Neighbor to Family because Neighbor to Family was able to provide the funding to get the items. So we kind of all had to work together to make sure everything was situated and was. And then I further did some linkage with her for, again, the medication management. She had a first therapy appointment today. So everything seems to be progressing with her very well. Families are wanting to know what they can do. I mean, no family wants to have unsafe children, but we can come up with ways together, always, 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 we can come up with ways together to make children safer, to raise the family's cognition about what characteristics they do have and how their actions impact their children. So all of us together work now for the ongoing safety of that child. Good afternoon, everyone. Secretary Carroll, thank you for your inspiring and encouraging message today. And speaking of inspiring and encouraging, how about that demonstration we just saw in that video of teamwork in action to save a child? Diligent, committed, resourceful professionals working together to keep a child safe and hopefully build a strong family that that child can live in for the future. I watched that video, I counted 11 individuals involved in that case. 11 individuals were mentioned, from the person who made the first hotline call, all the way through to the providers that were involved, the CPI. 11 people wrapped around and focused on that end result of keeping a child safe, saving a child's life, and building a strong family. This was a great testament to the power of collaboration and the power of teamwork which is our message today. We know that this is not an isolated ex uh, case, not an isolated example. This happens throughout our system every day. Um, many of you may, may not take long for you to think of a time that you were involved in a case like this. Or if you're not directly involved with cases, maybe you can think of a time that you worked on a systemic issue as a partnership 
to make the system better. This happens all the time. We also know, however, that as often as this does happen, there are also times when it doesn't happen. Times when we don't communicate, we don't collaborate, we don't partner together. We know what that feels like too. You know who really feels it though, when we don't work within our system as a team, is the children and families themselves. They probably know it more than anyone. The families that come into our system or encounter our, our services, they know when we're not on the same page. They know when the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, or the right hand does know what the left hand is doing and is doing this instead of this. Families see that. When we come together and work as partners in this system, exceptional things happen. When we don't, we get more of the same frustration that's characterized child welfare historically. So what do I mean by working as partners? What do we mean when we say we're going to be uh, working in partnership? Well, plain and simple to me, that means we're going to collaborate. We're going to work together toward the same end. And what more noble end is there? What more noble end could we be working toward? than having safe children who are developing in a healthy way and healthy lives in strong families. That's our common end. So the question is, if partnership and collaboration are so important, which clearly they are, why, as I just said, are there times we don't do it? Why are there times we choose to stay in our own silos or choose to leave issues to others? I think the reason for that, one big reason for that, is it's hard. As the secretary mentioned earlier, it's, it's not easy. You know, on a case level, we talked about having the resources to do your job. Sometimes it takes time to go the extra mile to communicate, to listen, to plan together. It takes energy to reflect back on what could I be doing differently and to listen to others' feedback on that. Time and energy are things like other resources in our system that are sometimes in short supply. But this is, there's no option to this. We have to put forth the effort to work as partners. Check our egos and our perspectives at the door. Be willing to have honest dialogue about the work before us. By now, you might be able to surmise I'm not really just limiting this to a case level because what's really powerful is partnership on a case is one thing, but partnering within our community on the system as a whole, partnering on the state level is equally powerful. In my experience, collaboration can be contagious. If we as the immediate partners within child welfare can embrace this collaboration, this partnership mentality, the greater community is going to catch on. The greater community is going to step forward. And it is happening. It's happening across our state. When we embrace the partnership approach, we get partners coming to the table that we may never, never thought we'd see being part of the solution to child welfare issues. How else can you explain the fact that our partners across our state today now include colleges and universities, local governments, faith-based groups, hospitals, libraries, civic groups, grassroots organizations, businesses. The list goes on and on of partners that are coming to the table. I've even heard of motorcycle clubs, scuba instructors, and Girl Scout troops coming forward and partnering with Child Welfare to find ways to help build strong families and be there for the children that need their community to step up for them. When we in this room lead the way in embracing partnership, communities are responding and it's opening the door to endless possibilities. You know, in preparation for my time on stage today, I asked my counterparts at the 16 other CBC, CBCs around the state for their perspective on partnership. 
the response was very, very clear. Partnership is the key to moving our system forward. Partnership is the key to having that world-class child welfare system that we always talk about. They gave me examples from all across the state of when we work as immediate partners with those that are work in the child welfare system day in and day out, and especially when we bring community partners into the mix. So it's transforming our system. Which brings us to today. You know, one of the first things, uh, the first week that uh, Secretary Carroll was appointed, I spoke to him that first week. He reached out to me, and in that New England accent that we all love, he said, I want to strengthen and renew our partnership. <laughs> and I said, I hope I, I thought to myself, I hope I get to hear that accent for a long, long time. Forget this interim stuff. I want to hear that for a long, long time. <laughs> but I could hear the passion in his voice when he said that. And since that day, Secretary Carroll, and his team has demonstrated the level of partnership that they want to have with the CBCs and with the providers and all the stakeholders in our system. We now have more work groups, task forces, subcommittees to work on system issues than I've ever seen. It is hard work, but we're getting things done. The CBCs and providers, just like everyone else, embrace the opportunity to partner and to do this work together. So let's take the opportunity, all of us take that opportunity to respond to the Secretary's message today and commit to partnering not just when it's easy, not just when it's convenient or when it's feel good, but make it the expectation each and every day to partner on the case level, on the community level, and on the state level. Because if we do that, we really will transform children's lives, transform families, and transform our system, our state system, in the process. Thank you. It's my pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, uh, Ms. Shelley Katz. Katz. Shelley is the, uh, she's the Chief Operating Officer. I heard some claps out there, Shelley. You got your peeps are here. All right. Uh, Shelly's the Chief Operating Officer for Children's Home Society of Florida, um, longtime colleague and partner of many of us in this room, and she's also the chair of the board for the Florida Coalition for Children. So I'd like to welcome Shelly, but before she takes the stage, uh, please join me in watching another video that uh, demonstrates the power of partnership in our system. I recently wrote a letter to the secretary of DCF outlining how the people who worked on our most recent case really came together in a way that to me d signaled how dependency should work. The CLS attorney, Diana Korn, and the guardian ad litem, Karen Ish, and the case manager, Bethany Milford, were shining examples of exactly how people should be when they work in dependency. The case manager had probably just as high of a caseload as any other case manager in the state. And this particular case was a difficult one because you were dealing with a biological family that had all sorts of issues from chronic pervasive homelessness, uh, drug and alcohol addiction, pervasive mental health issues. And the amount of time that Bethany had to put into this case, just this particular family alone was probably extreme, but she did it. You're dealing with uh, families uh, children removed from their families, that's a big deal. So if you're to get to a point of terminating a parent's rights, you want to make sure that you addressed every possible concern and tried to remedy every possible situation before you chose to basically end the rights of a parent. I realized that I could work as hard as I possibly could have with this family, however, their mental health issues were above and beyond the point of being able to allow children to safely return. You always want to try to get a family back together. However, when that's not possible and the child is placed, or in this case, siblings, 
that are placed in one foster home and then adopted. That's amazing. When uh, the guardian ad litem was assigned, Karen actually visited the children at the daycare. She visited at visitation with the parents. She went to meet with the parents themselves, with the parents of the parents. She'd come to our home and visit. Those are things that just, you know, don't typically happen in every case that you get, but they should. And it was incredible to watch all of this stuff happen. The siblings really needed to be in a safe, stable home. The foster home was a safe and stable home. Uh, there were a couple of bumps in the road where sometimes it took a lot longer to get to the point we needed to. I never doubted that the outcome would not be what we were aiming for based on the documentation and the stick to itness that occurred. Uh, Bethany was unbelievable in how she was able to document every appointment that was missed or everything that happened so that when we did go to court, she was able to recite exactly um, how the case had gone. And also just the stick to itness, both of, of her and the attorney in following through because it was a fairly long process. We were in constant contact, nightly telephone calls, almost every weekend. Um, we were constantly getting together. Um, and it was that collaborative effort, that teamwork approach that we were then able to illustrate to the court about how permanency was paramount for these children and was so desperately needed. I have found in the last five years that the wealth of knowledge that the caregivers have about the children in their care is vast. We take care of these children 24-7. We're the ones who wake them up in the morning when they're grouchy, and we're the ones who pick them up in the afternoon and kiss the boo-boos when they have boo-boos, and we're the ones who see what happens when they come home from visitation, and we're the ones who sees what happens when they come to us um, with all their trauma and all their experience, and we're the ones who make all of that better in some way. It may just be that we hug them and we kiss them and we, you know, we tell them that somebody's going to be there for them forever and ever, even if we're not that forever and ever person. Um, for me, the minute I'm told that a child is coming into our home, that child is part of my life forever. Um, but the key event that makes me realize, oh my gosh, these children are legally going to be ours forever is the moment the judge bangs the gavel and, and announces your child for the first time with their new legal name. And it's that you get that butterfly feeling that, oh my gosh, you know, that'll be my child until the end of time. But still to go through that roller coaster and, and then come to the end and, and know that it's over with that particular child, that's, that's a good feeling. So I felt like I should point it out and, you know, sing the praises of these women because what they did, in my opinion, was incredible. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is an amazing crowd, and I have to say it's very humbling and just a little bit intimidating to stand up here before you. Um, and I've been asked to speak about case management, and so I'll be speaking specifically from that perspective, case management and its role in our system. But I do not want in any way to diminish the importance of what the role each and every one of you in this room plays every day um, in protecting our children. And I just want to say I'm so appreciative to have you as my colleagues and that you are all here stepping up to do something. Um, what is the role of a case manager? The title itself is deceiving because we really don't manage cases. What we do is we help children find safety, security, happiness, and stability. We are confidants, we are teachers, advocates, fact finders, and fact checkers. We are networkers, service linkers, advisors, counselors, social workers, and the list goes on. But most importantly, we are change agents. We are catalysts for the change necessary to improve the lives of the 60,000 plus children that we care for in their own homes and in out of home placements. Case managers must have many skills. They must be knowledgeable about child development, domestic violence, substance abuse, mental health, psychotropic medications, education, children's medical and dental needs, parenting, community services, skills to transition to adulthood, 
how to navigate information systems, the legal system, time management, and I'm sure there are many more that you could add to that list. Case managers must have the skills to gather, assess, and, document, and record information, to observe and be attuned to what is said, and also to what is not said. Case managers are the central point of contact. They are the key individuals who assimilate and utilize all of the information from many sources to determine how best to meet the needs of the children and families we care for. I think our most important skill is communication. To be successful change agents, we must communicate well. We must listen. We must build relationships. We must be able to communicate with children, to listen, observe, and understand their trauma so that we can assess what they need to be safe and healthy. We must communicate with the protective investigators to understand the information that they've gathered and to collaborate on initial safety plans to keep children safe. We must be able to communicate with parents and caregivers to understand their challenges, to build trust, and to guide and empower them to successfully care for their children. We must communicate with our foster parents to understand their needs and challenges and to support them in caring for our children as if they are their own. We must communicate with the court. We must be able to tell the story and provide all the important information to enable the judges and magistrates to make critical decisions that impact the lives of children. We must communicate with the guardians who are charged with representing the best interests of our children. And we must communicate with our partners to make sure we are aligned in our efforts and make good use of our resources. We must make sure that nothing and no one falls through the cracks. And we must communicate to our communities, to our friends, our neighbors, our legislators. We need to tell them of the important work you do every day. And we need you to share your successes that you help create and the passion that keeps you coming back every day to make a difference in the life of one more child. But case management requires more than skill, more than knowledge, more than communication. Case management is an art. It is the art of taking in all of the information and using it to paint a picture. A picture of a child and a family unique and full of potential. It is the art of helping everyone involved to see that picture and to, and to engage them in painting the picture of a happy ending. People often ask me what it takes to be a successful case manager. So I'll ask you, how many of you were that kid? Stubborn as a mule, never knowing when to give up, asked way too many questions. How many of you were that kid who always brought home strays, whether kittens or puppies or your classmates who didn't want to go home? Sound familiar yet to anybody in the crowd? How many of you were the protectors of your siblings or the ones who wouldn't back down from a fight if it was for the right cause? That sounds like an excellent case manager to me. Successful case managers are curious and inquisitive. They are tenacious and persistent. They are unfailingly optimistic and resilient. They never, ever give up on a child. They are often the last in the car pickup line at after school care. And they have their neighbor or their family member on speed dial in case they need someone to pick up their kids because they're dealing with another child's crisis. They shop for prom dresses. They attend football games and school meetings. They hold frightened children's hands at doctor's appointments. And sadly, occasionally they must say goodbye at funerals. They boldly scour neighborhoods where others would fear to go looking for runaway teens. They care far too much to rest. I learned just this week of one of our case managers who left her own five children at home to take a critically ill infant to Miami for a liver transplant, where she stayed in the hospital 24-7, changing, comforting, and caring for that baby for six days straight. It's a big job, an important job to provide for the safety and well-being of Florida's vulnerable children. It is a job that no one agency and no one person can do alone. It takes all of us every day working together, sometimes against what seem like insurmountable odds. Some of the best advice I ever got was from my dad, who told me it is not enough to do your part and meet halfway, and when in doubt, give. And I have used that as kind of my barometer on every decision that I've made in my life since. And if everyone commits to doing that little bit extra, to looking beyond my job, to our job, our kids will be better served. It is the job of us on this stage today and our colleagues to create the environment that fosters trust and transparency that allow for partnership to flourish. It's our job to remove the barriers and to work together to make sure our system has the resources necessary to allow our frontline teams, 
our hotline counselors, our child protective investigators, our case managers and their supervisors to do the best job possible for Florida's children. It's our job to make sure we are inclusive and that we engage our many partners as we recognize that each of us plays a critical role necessary in protecting our children. The presence of all of us on stage today is evidence to me that we are making great strides toward a culture of collaboration and partnership. And I personally want to thank the Secretary and his team because I've witnessed the, that team going above and beyond on a daily basis to build and, and nourish the partnerships that we're forming. Um, those partnerships bring power to take our child welfare system to the next level. And I hope you all are as excited as I am by the opportunities before us. And now I have the privilege of introducing Kelly Paris. Kelly has um, 25 years of service in the field of prevention and is currently the executive director of the Children's Board of Hillsborough County. The Children's Board distributes over $28 million each year to community organizations serving children and families in Hillsborough County. And before Kelly takes the podium, please join me in watching our final video about the power of partnership. Thank you. So the Children's Board hosted a child safety summit in the spring. We invited all of um, our provider agencies and anyone really working in the field with children and families to come in and talk about this issue of the three leading causes of preventable child death. And uh, it was a great uh, conversation about how we need um, concise messaging, uh, the same messaging, something very easily understood by the public. And it was determined that the Department of Children and Families, Eckerd, uh, JWB, which is the Juvenile Welfare Board, and the Children's Board would all put in funds to launch a public awareness campaign. Today, the core partners got together to do the final rating session for the firm that's going to be chosen for the public awareness campaign. We narrowed it down to the top four. We will rate those and award the contract with one of these firms. In this day and age with social media and uh, the internet, we are so bombarded with information. And if we have one succinct, concise message and everyone's saying the same thing, we have uh, better success in getting through to people. Vince Aramo started 33 years ago. Um, our founder wanted to be involved with horses and wanted to be involved with individuals with disabilities. And this was the perfect combination. We have 23 horses in the program. We see 155 riders a week. Um, the Foster Kids program. We work very closely together, DCF and Vince Ramos, and those riders, they come once a week to volunteer. They support the riders with disabilities in grooming horses and tacking them up. They support that whole class, getting the riders on, getting the riders off. In particular, we have some boys right now who need to get community service hours. And they're finding it very difficult to find places who will take them to do those hours. So they know that they can come here, they can call us. And that confidence, that ability to say, well, I volunteer at Vince Ramos, or I work with kids with disabilities, that, that's a big deal. So these riders are concentrating on building their core strength, building their large muscle strength. Just holding their head up is difficult for them. So they're really working on themselves. As you can see from their faces, the smiles are from ear to ear every time they come. Just the opportunity to come here and spend time with the horses. Food banking is a concept that started in the late 1960s and it's a really efficient way to get that extra food and put it out there to the people who need help. And we do that through, the, through a system of uh, about 550 partner feeding programs. These are emergency food pantry programs, shelter programs, soup kitchens, places where people are turning for, for help. Um, you know, we get most of our food from companies within the food industry. And then the remainder of it comes from community food drives that are contributed, uh, literally hundreds of individual drives that are turned in every year. So what happens is these partner agencies who are going to be distributing this back at their locations um, can see what we have in our inventory pretty much on, online. They go online and they can see it in real time. Uh, they figure out what they need for their program and then they email that to us. And our guys go ahead and pull it and have it waiting for them when they uh, come down for their shopping appointment. When you're moving 63 million pounds of food through here a year, you have to be really efficient in 
and how that works. We hold about two million at a time, so that gives you a sense of how quickly it moves through here. And we know that that's a fraction of what's really possible. So as we ramp up over time with the help of the community, um, you know, we're, we feel like we're ready to do that now. Sherry Hart started in a time of a crisis in 2012 when there was an economically situation that we were getting a lot of foreclosures. So what we did is we said that we had an idea that we knew that the church could come and help our community. Our job is to make sure that we provide them with the help, uh, not only spiritual, but the first 72 hours of food and clothing. So Sherry Hart, the first thing we did is we provided a food bank in each of the three main hubs. There's been a lot of partnership with our, 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 our chaplaincy. Uh, Farm Share is one of the ones that supplied me all the food. Families and even victims come back and share their heart by giving their old clothes. Everything that you see here is donation clothes for their children. It's amazing how the first thing that a mother comes is look for their children's little things that they can wear. We have donations of good new shoes sometimes that we get. Uh, baby stuff, but it's how God really supplies, you know, all the needs. So I think that the, the, the key here is the work and the partnership between the state allowing the church to come in and be able to support them and help them. And of course, that's the call of the church. So it's nothing new for the church, except that we're collaborating. Well, I have to tell you, I'm all about partnerships, but I have never seen such a grand opening as this. What a different joy to see these children, and what a different secretary. So give them both a hand, if you would. Last night, we came in here to look at the setup of the room, and I looked around at the chairs, and I told the secretary, there are more chairs in this room than there are people in, in the town that I grew up in, and that's the truth. Um, but I'm gonna tell you a story of a bad partnership before I start out. My, the town that I grew up in uh, has 2,126 people. So uh, we had a two-way stop and a caution light. The town 10 down, miles down the road decided 25 years ago they were going to have a crawfish festival. So they borrowed our caution light. <laughs> well, 25 years later, they still have the caution light. And they don't speak to each other anymore. So we've got to remember when we enter into those partnerships that we have to do our part also and that we have to keep our word. So I challenge all of y'all today as we go through this conference and for the remainder of the week, look for those partnerships and think about what you can do. Start a community conversation about child safety. We have to have this conversation and we have to bring the par partners to the table. We can't do it alone. We know that the majority of children that are dying across the country are not known to child welfare and that's no different than Florida. So who do we have to engage? Everybody in the com community, the parents, the grandparents, the neighbors, the preachers, the teachers, uh, the business community, the civic community, on and on and on. So we have to do, what we have to do is look at child safety on different levels, a macro level and a micro level. On that macro level, we look at public policy, we look at systems of care, and as the secretary said, that's all of us practice standards. We need children's service councils all across Florida. Whether we have them in the circuit, whether we have them in a county, we need those flexible dollars. We need those flexible dollars to pull down federal dollars, to match dollars, and to be able to meet the needs of our local communities. At a macro level, we need them across the state. At a micro level, community awareness and education, training, empowering individuals to support healthy families, resource allocation, inclusion for the business community, the faith community, and the healthcare community. And we have to empower people to report child abuse when you see it. My son always tells me that I'm gonna die at Winn-Dixie or Walmart. <laughs> and I believe him. Uh, on a macro level, we have to stabilize our systems of care. We have to strategically stay the course with child safety and family stabilization at the center. At a micro level, we have to coordinate and integrate community service, public policy, 
engage the business community, and include the faith community, which we often leave outside the door. So when we say, how do we do that? For the realtor, that the realtor has the same mission that all of us have. Build healthy families, and you will have healthy communities. So we are putting toolkits in each house sold that have information all about child safety in it. For the small business owner, what can they do? Well, if they, say, if they sell cribs, they can display safe cribs and get out information on safe sleep. For the priest, it may be stepping outside of his comfort zone and, re and referring a family to professional counseling, but everyone has a role to play, and sometimes it's up, up to us to point that role out. At the end of the day, the goal is to create and maintain a culture of safety for the community. There's a need to move beyond raising awareness to something more powerful that instills responsibility and motivation into each and every individual. A sense that everyone is responsible for the safety of our children. Awareness of safety threats to our community is the first step, but it's not enough. We must change the behavior that places our children at risk, and your message has to be consistent, compelling, and long-term. It must be a call to action and galvanize the community. We must educate our community on the impact of threats to our children. As we know from the ACES study, a child can grow up in a loving home, but the exposure to, thre to threats throughout one's life diminishes the, uh, that child's life over, over time, the quality of life forever, and also the community in which that child resides. So I challenge you to go from Escambia County to Monroe County and all areas in between. Get a core group together, organize a child safety summit, make it a priority in your community, and we will be glad to help in any way. We have a very successful plan for that. Identify your coalition of partners. Tell your story and create your message. Identify each partner's role in the child safety campaign and create a call to action. There's never been an ordinary person that has affected the life of a child in a positive way. So having said that, I thank all of you extraordinary people in this audience that do the work every day and Secretary Carroll for his leadership. So thank you. And I'm gonna invite Secretary Carroll back up because he wants to recognize some people. Am I on? Oh, I really knew what I was doing and planning this because I bookended myself with Next Gen and a firecracker from Alabama at the end, right? <laughs> Who's still missing her caution sign. Uh, the next thing we're going to do, and I think this is probably the most important thing we're going to do at this session, is we're going to recognize, uh, we're going to continue the work that we did with the uh, films, and we're going to recognize teams for the teamwork that they displayed and for the positive income positive impact that they've had on the families uh, that they serve. When you call, when you hear your name, come on up, folks. And by the way, I want to show you this. We didn't give you just ordinary plaques. We gave you dinner plates with writing on them. <laughs> These are very special. Welfare Excellent Award for Circuit 2 goes to individuals making decisions to change lives. The winners are Bethany Milford with Children's Home Society, Diana Korn with DCF, Karen Ish, a Guardian at Lightham volunteer, and Heather Cox Rosenberg, foster parent and adoptive mother. You might recognize these individuals who were featured in the video we just saw a bit ago. It was actually Ms. Rosenberg who brought to the attention of the Secretary the outstanding collaboration between DCF, Case Management by Children's Home Society, and a Guardian ad litem Child Advocate. She took the time to write a heartfelt letter praising their work, and we wanted to make sure that she, too, is being recognized today. Hats off to our foster parents who are are an essential partner in working together to do what is best for our children. Please thank them and give them a warm round of applause.
This year's Child Welfare Excellence Award for Circuit 12 goes to a team that demonstrated extraordinary belief in family strength. The winners are Jeannie Dela and Christy Scoglin of the Florida Center, Lindsay Mullet and Kelly Carwatt of Safe Children Coalition, Ashley Chorba and John Showers of DCF. The team's effort led to a determination that undiagnosed fetal alcohol syndrome had been the cause of a mother's struggle with employment and child care. With the team's support, the father is complying with court orders and taking advantage of the interventions offered. The team members continue on a path for reunification and are convinced that the time spent understanding the root causes of the strife of these young parents will change the life of the family for the better, forever. Let's hear some applause for this team. The Child Welfare Excellence Award for Circuit 10 goes to Project Return. The winners are Andrea Rhodes and Tammy Thompson of DCF, Jeff Roth with Child Advocacy Center, Adam Ward and Kim Darty with Heartland for Children. Sometimes partnerships extend beyond our state lines while still requiring all of our collaborative work to make sure that a family transitions safely. This team worked with a family at great risk of having having children come into foster care primarily for financial reasons. The parents struggled with proper care for their eight children and they were displaced from their roots in Boston. There were many different approaches that our system could have taken from minimum response to removal of the children. It was this teaming approach for solutions that saw the family return safely home. Please thank them and give them a warm round of applause. The Child Welfare Excellence Award for Circuit 6 goes to a Children's Action Team. The winners are Brandy Lazarus with the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, Rebecca Wilkinson Shields with Pasco County Sheriff's Office, Janine Evely with Juvenile Welfare Board, Karen Hill with the 6th Judicial Circuit Office of the State's Attorney, Judy Tagney with Guardian at Litem Program, Lourdes Benedict with DCF, and Brian Bostick with Eckerd Youth Alternatives. This award recognizes the chairs of the Suncoast region who organize and hold monthly action meetings with many stakeholders in this large area. The team engages in an array of different community resources with its citizens who use this forum to find resolutions to issues unique to their community. And it serves as a reminder to all of them that it is essential to see things from other points of view. Please thank them and give them a warm round of applause. Applause. The Child Welfare Excellence Award for Circuit 7 goes to a team who recognizes communication is key. The winners are Rob Westcott, Cindy Ritchie, and Kelly Daniels McKenzie with Community Partnership for Children, Tangira Edwards, Latika Burks, Eunice Cruz, and Slade Dukes with DCF. With this team, communication is key and camaraderie is how this team is described when it comes to solving issues. They define this approach taken by individuals in the Daytona D-Land area for rolling out Florida's new safety methodology practice. This venue has allowed children's legal services, case management, and investigations to demonstrate their proficiency in this new way of practice. It was put to test on one case involving a mother 
mother, who was thought of as a resistant parent, had it not been for the team effort to get at the root cause for the perceived resistance, the team would not have collectively discussed language barriers that led them to solve problems for this family. Please thank them and give them a warm round of applause. For Circuit 15, this year's Child Welfare Excellence Award goes to a project referred to as High Priority. The winners are Meredith Gray, Patricia Vasquez, and Seth Denson of DCF, FBI agent Renee Blaze, and Roseanne Brown, Travis Walker, and David Harris of the Riviera Beach Police Department. What at first appeared to be a routine response to an investigation involving physical abuse turned into an urgent race for time. An adult who had physically harmed two young children fled the home with a two-year-old during the very early stages of an investigation. The Amber Alert system was deployed and the team worked quickly to identify possible locations of the toddler through information from extended family members. This multi-agency response led to the toddler's safe rescue in Minnesota. Let's give them a round of applause. The Child Welfare Excellence Award for Circuit 9 goes to a group of individuals giving life a second chance. The winners are Johnny Alderman and Latrice Glenn with the Department of Juvenile Justice, Bernie Vaughn, Kay Richardson, and Ann Lindsay Maori, CBC of Central Florida, Deborah Berry of Devereaux, Sarah Lawrence, and Ingrid Figueroa, and Audrey Barkley of Children's Medical Services. When a teenage boy came to the attention of our system for a variety of complex issues, they immediately paled to his most pressing circumstance. He had been diagnosed with a terminal illness. The team jumped into action to prevent the child from being forced to come into care. Funds were secured to financially support hotel expenses for his family while the teen was undergoing cancer treatment, including transportation to the hospital and assisting with referrals to other local resources. The team also got the teenager successfully transferred to his aunt in another state. The young man is now doing well. Please thank them and give them a warm round of applause. For Circuit 17, this year's child Child Welfare Excellence Award for Circuit 16 goes to the Keys Core Community Partners. The winners are Annabelle Fernandez of Our Kids, Karen Knight, and Paul Armstrong of the Department of Juvenile Justice, D. Mogavero, and Jill Welch of Wesley House Family Services, Elba Ornelas of the Guardian Ad Litem Program, and Lori Thompson, a foster parent. Thanks to the sheer determination of this team of caring professionals, a young teen has been given the opportunity to succeed in a residential treatment program that will make him eligible to attend college and set out on a very promising future. After a series of home settings, including a pre-adoptive placement, fell through, they fought to convince prosecutors and the courts that the teen needed another chance on probation to see if securing a treatment program was possible. The team expedited home study placement requirements, used personal funds to escort the teen to his new setting, and never lost faith in this child's promising future. Please show this team how much we appreciate their efforts. For Circuit 17, 
This year's Child Welfare Excellence Award goes to the training squad. The winners are Nabella Bag, Morgan Persiano, Miana Pinkney, Aritza Navarre of the Broward County Sheriff's Office, and Don Liberta and Dean Pronto of ChildNet. In the true spirit of partnering for change, the Broward County Sheriff's Office teamed with case management staff to jointly develop and provide training on a new safety methodology for all child protective investigators and case managers. The training squad coined a term, fluent in methodology, that includes a new way to provide feedback to field staff on how well they are implementing the safety framework practice through mentoring and written synopsis of casework activities. They also revamped field training materials and developed a new collaborative approach to transfer of cases. Let's thank this team for their extraordinary effort. The Child Welfare Excellence Award for Circuit 4 goes to the Clayway team. The winners are Shauna Novak and Jennifer Clark with Kids First of Florida, Elizabeth Franco and Margie Enzel with Clay Behavioral Health Services, Linda McCann and Katherine Williams with DCF, and Nicole Vaccara, a transitional trauma therapist. This team, known as the Clayway Team, is led by a core group who take pride in advancing initiatives initiatives to make their community safer for children and more helpful for families. This group is responsible for providing critical resources to investigators and case managers, onesies that say this side up to give to families with newborns, safety kits for use in homes to install locks and alarms on doors, pack and plays to provide to families immediately. When the safety methodology was first rolled out in this area, they created a safety management coordinator and began offering transitional therapeutic services. Please thank them and give them a warm round of applause. The Child Welfare Excellence Award this year for Circuit 11 goes to Circuit Bench Buddies. The winners are Judge Cindy Lederman, Judge Maria San Pedro Iglesia, Mary Woolley Larea, Administrative Offices of the Courts, Susan Summers and Jessica Allen from the Guardian at Litem program, Sylvia Godoy for Miami-Dade County Public Schools. This innovative partnership between the judicial and school system System, takes our judges, lawyers, and court staff out of the courtroom and brings them into the classroom to read to students. This group adopted a local elementary school and committed to reading in four kindergarten and four first grade classes monthly. They also give students books to take home to read with their parents. What better way to inspire a love for reading and strong families? Let's give them a big round of applause. In Circuit 13, this year's Child Welfare Excellence Award goes to Comprehensive Diversion. The winners are Jesse Rogers and Tammy Ganya of Eckerd Youth Services, Claire Marie Baez and Jennifer Hawk from the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office, Michelle Jones Remdev of Gulf Coast Jewish Family Services, and William Haymans of Grace Point Case Management. These Hillsborough County professionals created a a comprehensive diversion initiative by bringing together community, faith-based, fraternal, and professional organizations, working together and with providers in their community. Last year alone, they stabilized placements for 333 relatives and family friends who stepped up to take children in their homes, diverted 27 youth who were at risk of being locked out of their homes due to delinquent behavior, and connected over 2,200 families involved in child protective investigations with critical community resources. Please thank them for their good work with your applause.
This year's Child Welfare Excellence Award for Circuit 8 goes to Teaming for Teens. The winners are Sherry Ketchens with the Child Advocacy Center, Hannah Connolly with the Child Protection Team, Kelly Bennett and Sharice Brown with Partnership for Strong Families, Satara Radford, Dory Rary, Francine Tory with DCF. Sometimes the best solution for placing a teen out of home is with the family friend most familiar with the situation, especially when the placement decision is urgent. But it's also important to have a thoughtful collaborative plan B, and that is why this team merits this award. The team worked diligently to support a youth's desire for placement with a family friend, but most importantly, also establish alternate living arrangements that ultimately kept the child safe. Please give a round of applause for this team. In Circuit 5, this year's Child Welfare Excellence Award goes to a team for partnering quickly on a crisis case. The winners are Kim Phillips of the Child Protection Team, Jessica Dutto, Mark Burnett, Nicole Freericks of DCF, and Monet Taylor of Haven Shelter in Sumter County. This team is recognized for the swift action on a case involving an 18-hour standoff with a parent who kidnapped his child. The case includes Included critical support needs for a mother who feared her and her child's life, judicial interventions to ensure safety, and speedy access to therapeutic intervention provided by the child protection team. This is a perfect example of how this team worked side by side and cut through the artificial barriers coming together for all the right solutions. Please give this team a round of applause. Okay, we're about to wrap up. I have two special awards, and I see all these people leaving the room. They're lost, right? It's gonna be like all those people left the Miami Heat because they were down by 15 and came back and won. We are not reopening the doors. As secretary, I get to give out two awards, and they're the secretary's awards, and uh, I wanted to give it to two community folks who I think uh, made very special contributions to our system. Uh, this year and, and, and one uh, over a number of years. The first woman I would like to recognize, and, and despite the rumors, it is not because she loves Boston, it's not because she's a big Red Sox fan, although that helped. It's Carol Schofer, who I think... Come on up, Carol. This... Right? Sm small things pack a powerful punch, right? <laughs> Carol has done more to thank champion, you so much, thank you, Gary. has done more to champion our quality parenting initiative in this state than anybody I know. She has provided the leadership that has put for foster parents back at the forefront of our partnership. And I don't know a stronger advocate for acting in the best interest of children than this woman here, and so uh, she's a friend, but I also think she has done this state a great service, and so it's an honor for me to recognize you. Thank you, Mike. Can I say one thing? Now, I knew Carol was gonna wanna say something. I wanna so. say one thing. I wanna say this. I don't care how long the list would be. I go all over the country, you would be at the top of the list. There's no question. Ah. For, the, for that, I'll give you the microphone. Thank you. The second person I'd like to recognize, uh, I've been partnering for this woman. She showed up. Yes, she's that woman from that uh, town that had their caution light stolen. She, like me, sometimes speaks a little bit funny. Uh, but she came from Alabama, has a wealth of child welfare experience, moved to Hillsborough County, became the executive director of the Children's uh, Board and I think has been such a partner to child welfare from the day she arrived. 
She understands the value of community in protecting or, or establishing a culture that's protective of kids. And when we say we can't do it alone, I wish every community had a Kelly Paris in it. So Kelly, come on up. Do you want to say something, Kelly? I have a microphone if you'll turn it on. But I, I will say that um, partnering comes natural when you live in a place with only 2,126 people. So <laughs> if you don't help each other out, you can't make it. So thank you for all you thank do. You. Thank you all. All right. I want those back doors closed and locked because i got Next Gen coming up next, and it's going to be a dance party in here now. Folks, I hope you enjoy the rest of your this conference. Really We've put together, we think, some workshops that are really going to build upon the skill base we have in the room. Thanks for sharing the day with us. Goodness, I'll always say for all your goodness.